to smell what the rock is cooking. What is going on guys? Welcome back to my channel, the Turnbuckle Tribune, where today we're doing a super deep dive into the AWA, the American Wrestling Association. I can't wait to do this. This is going to be a long one as I am going to go way into it. Then we're going to cover, what, 31 years? It started in 1960, ended in 1991, but obviously we got to cover stuff before that and how leading up to it. And it's just going to be a lot, so sit back, relax, enjoy, and let's learn something today. So first, let's learn what the AWA is. The American Wrestling Association, founded by wrestler promoter Vern Gagne and his associate Wally Carbo, the Minneapolis Boxing and Wrestling Club, originally held membership in the National Wrestling Alliance until a dispute recognition of the NWA World Heavyweight Championship. In 1960, the group dropped out of the NWA and formed its own brand name, the, the American Wrestling Association. The AWA had originally been used as a brand name by promoter Paul Bowser from the late 1920s to the early 50s, and briefly in the 50s by Chicago promoters Ray, Ray Favonini and Leonard Schwartz, but Vern Gagne put a stamp on this so nobody else could ever use it again. Let's get an overview of what the AWA was. In the 1980s, the wrestling industry in America had three dominant promotions, WWF, WCW, aka JCP, aka NWA, aka Mid-Atlantic, and the AWA. <laughs> Vern Gagne's AWA had a long and storied history dating back to the 1960s. It was known for pr producing stars like Hulk Hogan, Jesse Ventura, and of course no other than the legendary Nick Bowenkle. AWA had a national TV deal with, with ESPN and a loyal fan base, but it was struggling to keep up with the WWF and WCW, who were expanding their reach and becoming more mainstream. Vern Gagne was a traditionalist who believed in promoting wrestling as a legitimate sport rather than entertainment. He was reluctant to embrace the glitz and glamour of the WWF, which was becoming more popular with the younger audiences. AWA also had a problem with, uh, with talent development. Vern relied heavily on established stars like Hogan, Bockwinkle, and Ventura, but failed to create new stars to replace them. By the late 1980s, AWA was losing ground to the WWF and WCW. Its TV ratings were declining and it was struggling to attract younger audiences. In 1988, Vern made a costly mistake by refusing to sign a contract with ESPN that would have gave AWA more exposure. Instead, he signed a deal with a smaller network, which was a major, major setback for the AWA. AWA also failed to recognize the importance of talent from other regions, such as Southern wrestlers who were popular in WCW. Vern, Vern's appeal was more interested in promoting his own wrestlers, which limited AWA's appeal. By the early 1990s, AWA was in dire straits. Vern was running shows in small towns for a few hundred people, and he accumulated a lot of debt. In 1991, the AWA fought for bankruptcy, and Vern was forced to sell off all of his assets to pay off his debts. He even made false claims about the value of his tape library to avoid losing everything. Let's really dive into the AWA, but first let's learn the background information that led to the creation of the AWA. Let's go all the way back to the years 1948. The National Wrestling Alliance was formed and become one of the most powerful entities in pro wrestling. However, complications arose in 1957 when Eduardo Carpenter defeated Lutez for the NWA title, leading to a dispute over who the rightful champion was. While the NWA officially recognized Dez as the champion, some renegade promoters, led by Wally Carbo, recognized Carpenter and even sanctioned the title change to Vern Gagne. With the two groups of promoters recognizing different champions, it became clear that a uni unification match was needed, but it never came. In 1960, after, failures after failed attempts to lobby the NWA for a unification match, Carbo, with Gagne's influence, split off and formed the AWA. The, they recognized the NWA, Pat Champ NWA champion Pat O'Connor as their first champion, but gave him 90 days to defend the title against Vern Gagne. The NWA ignored this challenge, and Gagne was awarded the AWA world title in August of 1960. This led to, led to the two officially recognized world champions for the first time since the formation of the NWA. And most of the time, the AWA version was around the waist of Vern Gagne. All right, let's dive into the first show right here. The, AW the first AWA car was held on August 9, 1960 in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Results of the card as follows. Tiny Mills and Stan Kowalski beat Vern Gagne and Joe Scorpello by disqualification. Jack Pesek defeated Jim Cambry. Roy McCarthy defeated uh, Don Gold. And Bob Rasmussen beat George Grant. In 1960, Vern Gagne took over the promoter of Minneapolis, replacing Tony Stretcher and buying a significant percentage of the Minneapolis Boxing and Wrestling Club. Gagne also became the territory's world title cl claiming and was in charge of the promotional end of the territory. This type of arrangement was common in the 1960s, though. This is not... This is very normal, with many wrestlers becoming the promoters in one of the territories and booking themselves as a top star. Minneapolis was, one of the, was the only city to recognize Vern Gagne's world title claim. But over the next few years, the AWA moved into West, Midwestern cities like Chicago, Milwaukee, and Omaha. Gagne wrestled in those cities during the, the early 60s, but he just wasn't billed as a world heavyweight champion in those particular towns. Gene Kinski was one of the toughest challengers Vern faced in Minneapolis. Kinski was a former player in the Canadian Football League and one of the best performers in the wrestling industry during the 1960s. Kinski defeated Vern on July 11, 1961, to capture the AWA's World Heavyweight title, but Vern recognized the AWA, regained the AWA title, my fault, from Kinski four weeks later on August 8, 1961. Vern also feuded with Bill, Mil Bill Miller in the Omaha Territory and brought him to Minneapolis as Mass Mr. M in late 1961. On January 9, 1962, Mr. M beat Vern Gagne to capture the AWA Heavyweight Championship and held the title for seven months. 
many challenges, many wrestlers challenged Mr. M for the AWA title and tried to unmask him as well, which also often led to the defeat. Wrestlers would try to unmask Mr. M instead of going for the win and the pinfall when they had him in trouble. Gagne would have eventually def uh, defeated him to regain the AWA belt, though. Gagne also competed frequently in the Omaha territory, where he won the Omaha version of the world title by defeating Don Leo Jonathan in 1961. Sorry if there's a little time jumps in this. I'm trying to do it as best in chronological order as I can, but there was a lot to cover. Obviously, everything won't be in here, but I am going to try to cover as much as I can. Vern later dropped the Omaha title to Fritz Von Erich, the legendary Fritz Von Erich of the Von Erich family. The future owner of World Class Championship Wrestling keeps making an appearance in 1962 before regaining it four weeks later. In 1963, the AWA and Omaha territories merged with Gagne losing both belts to Reggie the Crusher Lazowski before regaining them a few weeks later. The Crusher was Gagne's nemesis in 1963, with a few capable of selling out many arenas in the U.S. Gagne regained the AWA belt from the Crusher and later formed a tag team with the Moose Evans to, to defeat the Crusher and Dick the Bruiser for the AWA tag team titles. After his feud with the Crusher, uh, with the Crusher Gagne found a new en enemy in Marcy's Mad Dog Michonne, who defeated Gagne to win the AWA heavyweight title in 1964. Gagne unsuccessfully challenged Mad Dog several times for the AWA belt, and also teamed up with several partners to feud with the AWA tag team titles, handsome, including Handsome Harley Race and Pretty Boy Larry Henning, who is Kurt Henning's father. Gagne cut, cut deals behind the scene to add cities like Chicago, Milwaukee, and Denver to add to the growing AWA territory. Finally, in 1967, Gagne defeated Mad Dog Vachon to catch for the AWA Heavyweight Championship for the eighth time. Let's talk about the rise of a star in this industry. At this time in the 60s, but let's get to know him. My favorite person in the NW from the AWA, my fault. One of my favorite people to follow at through this time. It was truly fun to follow his reign as long as reigning. AWA champion of all time, Nick Bob Inkle. We're going to dive a little bit into his career as I feel he was the biggest AWA star of all time. Um, obviously, you had the Hogan, but Hogan was only there for three or four years. Bob Winkle was there for um, over 19, I believe. Uh, I want to say, let's dive into it. Nick Bob Winkle defined the AWA during the 1970s and 1980s with his legendary tag team reign with the Ray the Clipper, the Crippler Stevens, and his legendary reigns as AWA champion. Nick was born on December 6, 1934 in St. Louis, Missouri, to his father's Warren Bockwinkle, a journeyman wrestler who competed in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. Nick lived with his grandmother until he was 12 and attended six different high schools due to his father's constant moves from territory to territory. He was an excellent, excellent high school football player and earned a scholarship to the University of Oklahoma, but his scholarship was revoked due to two knee injuries leading him to transfer to UCLA. Nick's father came up with the idea for him to become a professional wrestler to make enough money to put himself through college. He received training from legendary wrestlers like Luke Thez, Lord James Blair, Wilbur Snyder, and Gene Kinski. The first match involving Nick that can be verified through newspaper clippings or eyewitness accounts was a draw against Ray Vilmer on August 22, 1955 in Memphis, Tennessee. Nick may have teamed with his father as early as 1954, but authenticated results of those matches are not yet, have not yet unearthed. Wrestling title histories list not being Nick Botwinkle as holding the Los Angeles version of the Beat the Champ International TV title in early 1955, but not, does not mention which wrestler he beat or ended his TV title reign. Nick competed in Southern California for the next several months and was usually billed as young Nicky Botwinkle. Botwinkle traveled to Midwestern cities such as St. Louis, Chicago, and Milwaukee during his summer break from college. He lost to established stars like the Sheik of Arabi, Hans Schmidt, and Angelo Poffo, but beat the lesser known wrestlers. In September of 1956, Botwinkle returned to Southern California and worked exclusively as a babyface. He gained the value experience against the likes of Sander, um, Zandor Kovacs, Ray Thunderstern, Lord James Blair, Sanders Schnabo, Billy Varga, Roy Shire, Don Arnold, and Luthez, just to name a few. In 1958, Botwinkle was drafted into the Army and stationed at Fort Ord in Monteria, California. He occasionally wrestled using the name Nick Warren and Dick Warren. In 1959, he wrestled sporadically due to his Army commitment. In 1960, Botwinkle kept using Elias's. Even after he got out of the Army, he was billed under the name Nick Bach in Milwaukee and Detroit and faced top wrestlers like Bill Miller, Joe Blanchard, and Angelo Poffo. He also faced Killer Kowalski, Dick the Bruiser, The Sheik, and Freddie Blassie. Despite whichever identity he used, the caliber of wrestlers he faced was among the best in the world. Now in the 60s, in 1960, Nick Botwinkle established himself as one of the top baby faces in Southern California, known for his good looks, physique, college education, and military service. He was also teamed with the other popular wrestlers like Laura James Blair, Ricky Romero, and Eduardo, and, and Eduardo Carpenter. Botwinkle and Blair's won the international television tag team titles in December 1960, but lost them soon after to Stan Holek and The Preacher. Botwinkle and Carpenter later won the tag titles in January 1961, enjoying a four-month-long reign before, before losing them to Mike Sharp and The Zebra Kid of May 1961. Botwinkle then headed to Texas, where he faced notable villains like the Iron Mike DiBiase, Waldo Von Erich, and Duke Kamuki, Kiyomuka, as well as teaming with Luthez and Rito Romero. He also had a title shot against NWA champion Buddy Rogers in July of 1961, which he lost. After a stint in Texas, Botwinkle teamed with Wilbur Snyder and Johnny Rubberman Walker before going to Hawaii in early 1962. He won the Hawaii version of the United States title, but lost to Curtis Ayuka Ayaka in June 1962. 
Botwinkle was often compared to Wilbur Snyder due to their similar looks and wrestling styles. In September 1962, Botwinkle and Snyder began te teaming together regularly in San Francisco and won the NWA World Tag Team titles on November 10, 1962. Let's jump to the 70s. I know this is a sudden jump, but this is an AWA deep dive, not a, not be not a Nick Botwinkle deep dive, you know. I just really want to show you what he was before because he was really known as a babyface uh, out west. He was never known as a heel like he was in the AWA. So I wanted to give you a, a glimpse into what Nick was before he got to the AWA and how this was such a sudden change um, to when he did get there. So let's jump to late 1968 into 1969, where Nick Bonquillo had a successful run in Hawaii, where he teamed up with Bobby Shane and feuded with Ripper Collins. Botwinkle and Shane won the Hawaiian tag team titles, but lost to Collins and Killer Buddy Austin soon after. He then moved on to the Georgia Territory in November 1969 and tra transformed himself into a clean-cut babyface, into a copy, cocky, upbitty Beverly Hills Hill. Botwinkle feuded with the many fan favorites in Georgia, including Joe Scarpa, with whom he fought with the, over the Georgia television title. He won the Georgia Heavyweight Championship in April of 1970 by defeating the assassin number one, who was Tom Ernesto. Nick continued to feud with Scarpa, the professional, and the Mongol, but lost the title to Paul DeMarco in July, only to win it back a week later. Botwinkle participated in a one-night elimination tournament in June, which he earned himself a shot at the NWA Championship against Dory Funk Jr., but he was unsuccessful. Nick had another shot at the NWA Championship in August of 1970, but once again, he battled Funk to a time limit draw. He was contacted by Vern Gagne and dropped the Georgia Heavyweight title to Buddy Colt on September 4th, 1970, and he was prepared to join the AWA. Botwinkle's stint in Georgia was significant in the development of his wrestling career, as he demonstrated his ability to be a top hill. Oh, he was so good at it. After taking a few months off, Nick Botwinkle began full-time in the AWA and quickly established himself by going on a winning streak against wrestlers like Billy Red Cloud, Edward... Ed 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 Edward... Carpenter, I don't know how to say his first name, I'm just going to call him Carpenter, and Ernie Ladd. In August of 1971, the decision was made for Bockwinkle to team up with another AWA newcomer, Ray the Crippler Stevens, who was regarded as one of the top performers of his era. To quickly get Bockwinkle and Stevens over as the most villain, villainous tag team in the territory, the AWA needed a big angle. On August 28, 1971, during a televised match between Stevens and Red Bastion, Botwinkle came, came to ringside, Bastion slugged him, and then Stevens nailed Bastion from behind, leading to a two-on-one assault established the hated Botwinkle and Stevens as a tag team. The attack against Red Bastion was significant for several reasons. It, sin it, signif it signified, Jesus, the formation of Botwinkle and Stevens' tag team, established a feud between Bastion and the team of Nick and Ray, and showed the fans that the duo would do whatever it takes to maim their opponents. Red Bastion and Hercules Cortez had won the AWA tag team titles for Mad Dog and Butcher Vershawn on May 15, 1971. However, two months later, on July 23, 1971, Bastion and Cortez were involved in a serious car accident that changed the course of AWA wrestling history. After taking some time off to recover from his injuries and touring Japan and defending the AWA tag team titles with Billy Howard as his partner, Red Bastion returned to the AWA and selected the Crusher to take Cortez's place as the AWA tag team, champion, as tag team championship partner. Nick Botwinkle and Ray Stevens were the top contenders to the AWA tag team titles held by Red Bastion and the Crusher. The two teams would battle over the AWA tag belts for the next few months with Bastion and Crusher hanging on to their titles. On January 20, 1972, in Denver, Colorado, Botwinkle and Stevens defeated Red Bastion and the Crusher to capture the AWA World Tag Team titles. The finish of the match, Red, uh, Red had Bastion about to deliver the atomic drop finisher to Stevens where he kicked him in the stomach. Before, when he was kicked in the stomach by Botwinkle, Bastion fell to the mat and was pinned by Stevens. The victory established Botwinkle and Stevens as the top tag team in the AWA and began, began their legendary reign as the AWA World Tag Team Champions. What really made Botwinkle and Stevens so good is because they had contrasting personalities. which really helped them blend together as a tag team. Botwinkle was a smug Beverly Hills, Californian snob, while Stevens portrayed the rough San Francisco, California barroom brawler. So during that latter part of 1972, Botwinkle and Stevens ventured to Hawaii to defend their AWA tag team titles against Billy Robinson and Bill Francis. Robinson and Francis defeated Botwinkle and Stevens on November 15, 1972 in Honolulu, Hawaii to capture the AWA tag team titles. This title victory by Robinson and Francis was not acknowledged anywhere outside of the Hawaii and is generally ignored by most record books. Robinson and Francis did defend the AWA tag team belts one time in Honolulu on November 29, 1972, before being announced as having been stripped of the titles for failure to defend. Despite being considered the most serious threat to the AWA champion, Ver Gagne, fans still cheered Robinson. Robinson and Gagne had mutual enemies in Bockwinkle, and Stevens had formed a partnership in late 1972. The dream team of Billy Robinson and Vern Gagne defeated Nick Bockwinkle and Ray Stevens on December 30th, 1972 in Minneapolis, Minnesota to win the AWA Tag Team titles. Bockwinkle and Stevens regained the tag straps from Robinson and Gagne one week later on January 6th, 1973 in St. Paul, Minnesota. Billy Robinson recruited Hawaiian star Don Morocco as his tag team partner to challenge Botwinkle and Stevens for the AWA titles. Robinson and Morocco had seven opportunities to beat them, but they were unsuccessful. The Texas Outlaws, uh, the rise of Dusty Rhodes and Dick Murdoch, were a tough tag team known for being policemen. 
which the AWA booked non-title matches between Bob Winkle, Stevens, and Rhodes and Murdoch in several cities during May of 1973, which always ended in double disqualification. Bob Winkle and Stevens eventually defeated, defended their titles against Rhodes and Murdoch and emerged victorious. Nick and Ray often, often defended the AWA tag team titles in Chicago, where they forced wrestlers from both the NWA and WWA promotions to face them. One team that earned a shot against Bob Winkle and Stevens in Chicago was a pairing of WWA star Dick the Bruiser and AWA star Wahoo McDaniel. Who defeated superstar uh, um, Graham and Ernie, Lan Ernie Ladd to earn their title shot? Um, Nick Bobbinco and Ray Stevens introduced their new manager Bobby Heenan and go into the match against Vern Gagne and Jim Brunsell. Intentionally got themselves disqualified and attacked their opponents after the match. Larry the Axe Henning, who had been feuding with Gagne and Brunsell, came out to save them, clear the ring of Bobbinco, Stevens, and Heenan. This event marked a turning point for Gagne and Brunsell, who became major players in the AWA tag team division and began feuding with Bobbinco Stevens. With Heenan interfering in matches, Bachwinkle and Stevens quickly regained their championships and form and received several title shots against Billy Robinson and the Crusher. On October 24, 1974, Nick Bachwinkle and Ray Stevens defeated Robinson and the Crusher with Heenan's interference to win the AWA Tag Team titles for the third time. However, this reign was much different than the others as Larry Henning became a major challenger for Bachwinkle and Stevens. Superstar Billy Graham and Dusty Rose emerged as a strong tag team, but Graham left the AWA before the title match against Bachwinkle and Stevens, leaving Rose without a partner. Rose was attacked by Bob Winkle Stevens in the match until the Crusher come, comes to his rescue, leading to an impromptu match. Rose and the Crusher won, but were not awarded the titles because of Graham's absence. Dick the Bruiser and Crusher defeated Bob Winkle Stevens on July 16, 1975, to win the AWA Tag Team titles for the fifth time, leading to trouble between Bob Winkle Stevens, but that's a story for another time. And now it's time for Bob Winkle to go pro. All of that to finally set up the meet. Bob Winkle's first title reign from November 8, 1975 to July 19, 1980. And, and that time, we'll also see the rise of Hope Hogan. So this is really, all this has led up to this, because this is the juiciest part of the AWA and my personal favorite part to cover. Um, this is just really fun in general. I can't wait to share this with y'all. So... After losing the AWA tag team titles to the Cruiser, Bruiser and the Crusher, Nick Bollinkle teamed with Stevens and Rashke in unsuccessful attempts to regain the titles. Bollinkle also had a singles bout against the Crusher and Pom Pompero Firpo and fused against Vern Gagne, Greg Gagne, and Jim Brunsell. Bobby Duncan made his AWA debut on November 1st, 1975, defeating Peter Lee as a member of the Heenan family. On November 8, 1975, Bonk Winkle defeated Vern Gagne to become the new AWA World Heavyweight Champion with Bobby Duncan interfering in the match. Bachwinkle's early challengers included Pamper or Fur Pro. Sorry, it's going to be a long ass list. Uh, Larry Henning, Peter Maivia, Dick the Bruiser, Walter McDaniel, Josh LeDuck, The Crusher, Greg Gagne, Jim Brunsell, Chris Taylor, Red Bastion, and Wilbur Snyder. Bachwinkle will often get himself intentionally disqualified to receive help from Heenan and or Duncan to retain the title against these challengers. Bachwinkle also faced villains like Matt Davishan, Baron Von Rash, and the Buddy Wolf, and has several rematches against Ryan Gagne, but was always able to retain the title. Botwinkle's most difficult challenger is Andre the Giant, who battled Botwinkle to a double disqualification on August 27, 1976. Ray Stevens had left the AWA to compete in Florida, and his, back and his role in the Heenan family was taken away from Bobby Duncan, who teamed up with Black Jack Lanza to win the AWA tag team titles on July 23, 1976. In October of 1976, Ray Stevens returned to the AWA, but he didn't have a role in the Heenan family because Botwinkle, Lanza, and Duncan, who were all world title holders, uh, Stevens was also often ignored or interrupted by Heenan during the Heenan family's allowed interview time on All-Star Wrestling. On the December 1976 edition of All-Star Wrestling, wrestling magazine writer Bill Apter was on hand uh, to present Bobby Heenan with a trophy for manager of the year. Bob Winkle congratulated Heenan, and Stevens attempted to do the same. However, Heenan quickly interrupted Stevens and yelled at him to get his hands off of him. Stevens punched Heenan in the face and then smashing his manager trophy, trophy into pieces by hammering it against a turnbuckle. Lanza, Lanza and Duncan hit the ring, and along with Bob Winkle and Heenan, attacked Stevens. Stevens became a babyface as a result of this, and going to challenge Bob Winkle for the AWA title through, throughout 1977. And then we have British superstar Billy Robinson returned to the AWA in late 1976 and had many great bouts with Bob Winkle for the AWA title during late 1976 and throughout 1977 as well as um, Stevens, my fault. Robinson was unable to capture the AWA Heavyweight Championship for Bob Winkle, though. Former WWF champion Pedro Morales entered the AWA in late 1976 as well, but wasn't very impressive in his AWA outings. Mor Morales received several title shots at Bockwell, but failed to defeat him, like all challengers before him. In late 1977, Toronto promoter uh, Frank Tooney arranged for the AWA championship Nick Botwinkle to defend his title on several interpromotional cards featuring stars from the WWF, Jim, Cro Dr Jim Crockett Promotions, Canada, and the AWA. On October 16, 1977, Botwinkle defeated Dominic DiNucci, a um, wrestler who had been successful in the WWF and had been aligned with Bruno San Martino. DiNucci would later cross paths with Botwinkle again in Chicago while wrestling for the Indianapolis-based WWA. On October 20th, 1977, Bachwinkle defeated Ed Eduardo Ca Capinder, who was winding down his legendary career, but was still a huge name in Canada. The card also featured WWF champion superstar Billy Graham defeating Stan, Stan Stasiak. 
On December 11, 1977, Bachwinkle defeated Carpenter again. This card also featured Billy Graham and Chief uh, defeating Chief J. Strong Strongbow. And then we jumped to January 8, 1978. Bachwinkle defeated Stan Stasiak, a former WWF champion known for his heart punch. Stasiak had a following in a Toronto, and fans were disappointed when he lost to Bachwinkle. On February 5, 1978, Bachwinkle defeated Chief J. Strongbow, who had a story career for his using his real name, Joe Scapper in Florida and Georgia, and then reinventing himself as an Indian chief in the WWF in 1970. These interpromotional matchups were uh, were what made Toronto Card special. On, on February 18, 1978, AWA Tag Team Champions Greg Gagne and Jim Brunzel defeated Bachwinkle and Bobby Heenan. Gagne used a sleeper to defeat Bachwinkle in this account here. Gagne's win over Bachwinkle earned him an AWA title shot against Bachwinkle in the next card, but Bachwinkle would defeat him. Uh, Bachwinkle had worked with both Gagne and Brunson hundreds of times since their debut in 1973, which led to outstanding matches whenever each of these others faced each other for the AWA World title. We're going to jump to May 15, 1978 here, where Bachwinkle had a no contest with Jim Brunson, which was a part of the High Flyers feud. This is one of the few matches in Toronto where Bobby Heenan appeared as Knicks manager. On June, uh, in June, on June 20, 25th, 1978, Bachwinkle defeated Rufus R. Jones, a charismatic wrestler known as a freight train. The card also featured uh, WWF champion Bob Backlund pinning Ken Patera. On July 16, 1978, Bachwinkle defeated Angelo Mosca, a huge star in the Canadian Football League who was billed as King Kong Mosca in the AWA. Mosca was kept apart from Bachwinkle in the AWA, but was given a title shot in Toronto. On September 10, 1978, in Toronto as well, Andre the Giant replaced Angelo Mosca and defeated Bachwinkle by countout. WWF champion Bob Acklin also worked on this card, pinning Gorilla Monsoon. And then we jumped to January 14, 1979, also in Toronto. Dino Bravo, the reigning Canadian heavyweight champion, defeated Bachwinkle by DQ. This match gave instant credibility to the Canadian heavyweight championship, which Bravo held at the time. And then we go to February 4, 1979. Bachwinkle defeated Tiger Jet Singh by DQ, getting himself disqualified in order to, in order to retain his title. And then we go to March 3rd, uh, March 4th, my fault, 1979. Bachwinkle defeated Billy Robinson in a match that treated Toronto fans... To the wrestling excellence that about between these two could provide, it was given uh, what, a five-star match, I believe. Um, then we go to March 25th, 1979. Bachwinkle and Bob Blackham battled to a double countout in a title versus title unification match. This title match, this was the match Toronto promoted. Frank Tooney had been building to for several months, and it didn't disappoint anybody. And then we have Dino Bravo making his AWA TV debut in October of 1979, and had several title shots against AWA champion Nick Bachwinkle throughout the late 1979 and the first half of 1980. Although he did not win the title, his matches with Bob Winkle were impressive, impressive and established him as a credible contender. Bobby Heenan returned to the AWA in December of 1979 began, began a feud with fellow manager Lord Alfred Hayes, who had been managing the Super Destroyers. Super Destroyer Mark II aligned himself with Heenan and Bob Winkle, while Hayes joined forces with the Crusher and occasionally Mad Dog Vachon and Greg Gagne in a series of singles, tag, team, and six-man matches. After several months of feuding, Super Destroyer Mark III left the AWA, and Hayes lost a series of loser least talent matches to Heenan. Heenan and Bachwinkle then turned on Super Destroyer Mark II, eventually him, driving him out of the AWA. In summer of 1980, Vern Gagne had not received an AWA title shot against Bachwinkle in almost two years, and the two engaging in a storyline where Gagne, Gagne claimed Bachwinkle was ducking him, and Bachwinkle claimed Gagne did not deserve a title shot. On July 18, 1980, at Kamasiki Park in Chicago, Illinois, Vern Gagne used his sleeper hole to defeat Nick Bachwinkle and win the AWA heavyweight title for the final time. I never really understood the point of this. When I was going back and researching it, I, this made me so mad because he just held the belt for 10 months after this, and he didn't really defend the belt at all. So the beautiful, um, the Nick's 1,716-day seven, um, reign, they could have kept it going. I don't know why it happened, but I guess it was a beautiful storyline. The match was highly anticipated. And it was it was a two year build, I guess, but I still didn't like it. I guess I'm just biased towards Nick, but uh, he would drop back the belt back to him. Um, I think May of the next year, if I'm not mis if I, May 19, 1981, um, and he won it July 18, 1980, and he barely defended it. So that was my only complaint from that. I think you could have a double count like you've been having and had Hogan win it. He never wanted to put Hogan over. I don't know why. Uh, I, <laughs> don't get me started on this. All right, we're gonna close out the 70s here, but we begin the rise of Hogan in the early 80s. So we have Vergania planning to retire soon and book the next few years of the AWA action as a swung song. Gagne brought in Mad Dog Vashon as a tag team partner and defeated Pat Patterson and Ray Stevens on June 6, 1979 in Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada to capture the AWA tag team titles. Gagne beat Nick Botwinkle for the AWA Heavyweight Championship on July 18, 1980 in Cosmic Park in Chicago, Illinois while still holding the AWA tag team titles with Vashon. Gagne and Vashon were stripped the AWA tag team titles when Gagne no-showed a scheduled tag team title Defense against Adrian Adonis and Jesse Ventura, where the titles were awarded to Adonis and Ventura by the AWA Championship Committee. 
Got to handle the AWA championship for 10 months before retiring. Literally fucking retiring. He just didn't put his ego over it seemed. As the world's heavyweight champion, and Bachwinkle was awarded the AWA title nine days later. Like, what the fuck? Mm-hmm. The early 80s saw many new stars such as in the AWA, such as Dino Bravo, Rick Martel, and Tito Santana as the fan favorites to challenge Bachwinkle. The colorful East-West connection of Adriana Adonis and Jesse Ventura re, um, reigned as tag team champions. Jerry Crusher's Black, Blackwell emerged as the area's top hill and formed a tag team with Big John Studd, and they wrecked havoc in AWA. Hogan debuted in AWA in the summer of 1981. It was paired with luscious Johnny Valiant as his manager. Hogan's star potential was realized, and Valiant was let go. Hogan, Hogan became the AWA's number one babyface. Hogan's first major feud in the AWA, AWA was against the villain, villainous um, Jerry the Crusher Blackwell. After he attacked um, Brad, I'm going to butcher the shit out of this, um, Reigns, I guess, Re- 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 Hogan and Blackwell took their body slam challenge match all over the territory, with Hogan always um, going over after body slam the 468-pound Blackwell. Hogan was cast as the th- as Thunderlips and the Rocky Three and received a huge amount of pu- publicity, but Vern Gagne did not think putting an entertainer-, entertainer as a world champion was the right way to go. Vern Gagne's philosophy was not not to fix what was what wasn't broken and to promote the same way in the Midwest for over 20 years. Gagne viewed top-notch workers as world champions and didn't believe Hulk Hogan was world champion material for his promotion. In the summer of 1982, Gagne brokered a deal with European superstar Otto Wands to become the AWA World Heavyweight Champion. Wands paid Gagne a sum of money, and his title reign was short-lived. Gagne still saw his son Greg Gagne as the future of AWA and almost. Every Gagne and Brunson match would end in Gagne scoring the victory with the Gagne sleeper. Um, Greg Gagne, he was okay, but he was never going to be a superstar or never going to be a Hulk Hogan material. And, uh, it was very frustrating seeing the push he got just because it seemed he was Vern's son. Even though I did like Greg, he was a good worker. But just because he's Vern's son, he shouldn't be put in the main event right away. Uh, Sheikah Don Okisi was originally billed as the Arabian ma- madman, but was later molded into being a wealthy sheik who wasn't afraid to throw his money around. He later teamed up with Jerry Blackwell and, and bought the contract of Ken Patera to form a successful tag team. Nick Bockwinkle was uh, needed to be replaced as the AWA champion by a younger wrestler uh, immediately. He was getting old, you can tell. His matches weren't as good anymore. He wasn't wrestling as much as he was in his legendary title reign. Um, Burn Gagne re- uh, refused to replace Bockwinkle with Hogan as the AWA champion, despite Hogan's popularity as a gateway attraction. Hogan received several title shots against Bockwinkle, but most of the matches ended in controversial decisions with Neil Man scoring a clean victory. McMahon saw Hogan's popularity and national media attention and made him an offer to become the WWF world champion, which Hogan accepted, leading to his departure from the AWA. Many Many AWA stars followed Hogan to the WWF, causing the AWA to lose its most popular star and top drawing card, leading to the decline in attendance and the promotion's popularity overall. Now we're into the mid 1980s, but if y'all would like to see me do a deep dive more into Hogan's career, I did the Bachwinkle because you know he was there a lot longer. Obviously, Hogan was there for I think only three, three to five years maybe, um, full time. So if you'd like to see me do that or just do a breakdown of Hogan's career in the 80s, let me know. But let's jump into the mid 80s and the AWA really to start the, de- the decline of the AWA, and we start to see. Um, why um, Vern is just not the right guy to be booking anymore. In 1984, Nick Botwinkle was still the AWA Heavyweight Champion and Vern Gagne had not yet chosen his successor. All Japan Pro Wrestling owner Shohei Giant Baba offered Vern Gagne a sum of money to have Jumbo Tutsura, um, if I butcher that, I'm sorry, beat Botwinkle for the AWA title, which Gagne accepted. Jumbo Tutsura beat Nick Botwinkle on February 22nd, 1984 in Tokyo, Japan to become the new AWA Champion. The WWF had already taken several key AWA talents, including Hulk Hogan, Jesse Ventura, David Schultz, and Mean Gene Okerlund. So when the WWF uh, began countering AWA babyface Rick Martel, Vern promised Martel the AWA title to keep him for championship. Martel beat Jumbo Tutsura on May 13th, 1984 in Minneapolis, Minnesota to become the new AWA Heavyweight Champion. Although Rick Martel was a skilled wrestler, he lacked charisma and could not cut a babyface promo, making it hard to excite the fans, which I the Sheiks, Jerry Blackwell, and Kim Matera held the AWA Tag Team title since defeating Greg Gagne and Jim Brunsell with Sheik Adon and El Kasi frequently invo- interfering to help them keep the uh, Tag Team titles. Kim Matera and Mr. Sato were involved in an incident at, at McDonald's in Waukesha, Wisconsin, where they were denied service and threw a 30-pound rock through the window. Um, Patera and Sato were arrested, and they resisted arrest, attacking police officers who arrived on the scene. Patera and Sato were eventually subdued and jailed, with uh, Patera leaving the AWA soon afterwards. What a fucking crazy story. That was, When I was reading about that, that was insane. Never heard that one before. If you haven't, uh, you can just look it up. At, um, uh, what a good read. Uh, the Fabulous Ones, which is Steve Kern and Stan Lane, and the Road Warriors, Hawk and Animal, were brought to the AWA to fill the talent void left by the um, defections to the WWF. The Road Warriors defeated the, uh, the Crusher and Baron Van Rusk for the AWA tag team titles on August 25th, 1984, in Las Vegas, Nevada. 
In order to combat the WWE's growing popularity, the AWA and NWA formed a partnership to create a TV program called Pro Wrestling USA, but the partnership ultimately failed. The AWA then secured a deal with the ESPN to broadcast their matches on a weekly basis starting in September of 1985. The Royal Warriors Hawk and Animal dominated the AWA tag team scene and took on all comers, including the fabulous Freebirds. The two teams had a series of matches, but no decisive winner ever emerged. The Freebirds won the AWA tag team titles in a controversial match against the Royal Warriors on September 28, 1985, but the decision was reversed after the match, allowing the titles to remain with Hawk and Animal. The next night, the Freebirds interfering, interfered in the Warriors' title defense against Jim Brunson and Steve Regal, which allowed Garvin and Regal to win the AWA tag team titles. Rick Martel had turned back all challengers for his AWA heavyweight championship, but was eventually uh, defeated by Stan Hansen on December 29, 1985 in East Rutherford, New Jersey. Gorgeous Jimmy Garvin and Mr. Electricity Steve Regal held the AWA tag team titles for nearly four months before Regal let the AWA, while still a champion, forcing the AWA to um, say Garvin and Regal lost the belts to Kurt Henning and Scott Hall on January 18, 1986 in New Mexico. What, one of my favorite teams is Big Kurt Henning. I'm Kurt Henning. And Big Scott Hall. As tag team champs, we'll take on them all. So bring on the long riders, those dirt ball dumbos. We'll smear those bushes. Do the Wrestle Rock Rumble. Oh, damn, did I say it wrong? Um, if you've never seen the Wrestle Rock Rumble, go fucking watch it. That shit makes you crack up so much. Uh, Kurt Henning and Scott Hall were short-lived champions and uh, dropped the tag team titles by count to Playboy Buddy Rose and Pretty Boy Duck Summers on May 17, 1986 in Hammond, Indiana due to interference by um, Colonial De Beers. Colonel De Beers, um, uh, the AWA then decided to push Henning into Hall as single competitors, which uh, would ultimately end up better for both of them in the long run. The AWA's attendance and payoffs for the wrestlers were declining in 1986, leading to departures of wrestlers for the WWF and the NWA. Stan Hansen, despite being the AWA champion, pledged his alliance to All Japan Pro Wrestling, leading to his gimmick as a tobacco joint Texas brawler to not attract uh, fans to his AWA matches. We had the rise of Shawn Michaels and Marty Jannetty debuted as single wrestlers in the AWA in 1986, but were soon paired as a tag team called the Midnight Rockers, which eventually won the tag team, AWA tag team titles on January 27, 1987 in St. Paul, Minnesota. Kurt Henning became the top challenger for the AWA championship. Nick Botwinkle, um, AWA champion Nick Botwinkle and wrestling Botwinkle to a one-hour draw in a match team in Nationwide on ESPN, but failed to win the title. Henning defeated Botwinkle at Superclass 2 in San Francisco, California on May 2nd, 1987 with the help of Larry Sabisco, passing him a roll of coins to knock out Botwinkle. The AWA Championship was held up under pending review by the AWA Championship Committee, but Henning ultimately uh, chose to remain with the AWA, and a week later he was announced as a new AWA Heavyweight Champion. Botwinkle only wrestled a few more matches after this uh, bout with Sabisco, and Larry claimed on television that he retired Botwinkle, which was definitely not true, but he went with it. A very guy named Booker Ray Stevens weren't marketing geniuses at all, and believed wrestling in 1987 should be presented in the same fashion as it was in the 60s and 70s. They never adapted to the modern wrestling era in the 80s, and I uh, imagine what they would be like now. A uh, guy named Stevens gave their new heel AWA champ a lame persona that didn't resonate with fans, and the AWA uh, struggled to establish Henning as a compelling villain. It really wasn't getting over. I've watched some of the ESPN and AWA, and I really didn't like Kurt Henning as a Kurt Henning cool. Um, the persona he was giving, I didn't, I, I didn't like it at all. Despite this, Henning was a strong choice to replace Botwinkle as AWA Kingpin, as he was relatively young, and he was a very good worker. We will say that he just didn't have a good gimmick right here. The AWA struggled to create uh, cutting edge characters, like I said, exemplified by the decision to name name, name Kurt Henning just cool. Literally, your world champion is just cool. That's it. Um, the AWA lost many of its top talents to rival promotions like WWF and NWA, including the po popular tag team, the Midnight Rockers, uh, which was Shawn Michaels and Marty Jannetty. Martin Gagne uh, relied on the past prime wrestlers and young and up-and-comers to fill the void left by departing talent. Gagne made a deal with Jerry Jarrett to exchange wrestlers with his Memphis promotion in an effort to stay competitive. Despite this, um, despite his lack of popularity with fans, Greg Gagne was pushed as a contender for the AWA Championship, which should never have been done, but the uh, other AWA promoters did not support this. Martin Gagne created the AWA International TV title for just for his son Greg to hold and defend when it became clear that he was making him an AWA champion was not possible at all. The Midnight Rockers returned to the AWA and, and defeated the original Midnight Express, which was uh, Dennis Condry and Randy Rose, for the AWA Tag Team titles. DDP was given his first break in the wrestling um, business as a manager of the Hill Tag Team Bad Company, which was Pat Tanaka and Paul Diamond, who defeated the Midnight Rockers for the AWA Tag Team titles. Jerry Lawler came, uh, became the number one tender for the AWA Championship and defeated Kurt Henning to win the win the title on May 9, 1988 in Memphis. Well, we're really coming down to the end here. Really coming down to the last couple of years of the AWA. Um, the AWA and CWA formed an alliance to help combat the WWF and NWA, but didn't have a, have the desired effect. The AWA crowds continued to fall despite the infusion of Memphis wrestlers like Jerry Lawler and Bill Dundee. The CWA, on the other hand, benefited greatly from the alliance with the AWA, with the Lawler's AWA title wins drawing large crowds in Memphis. First of all, Nair's Dallas-based promotion also joined the alliance with the plan to work uh, together for several months and then produce a pay-per-view pay broadcast. 
Jerry Lawler, Jerry Lawler defended the ABA Heavyweight Championship frequently, frequently facing wrestlers like Tommy Rich, Buddy Landale, and Dutch Mantel in Memphis. Lawler also defended the ABA title against a variety of opponents in different settings, including Doug Furness, Eddie Gilbert, Austin Idol, Terry Taylor, and Kurt Henning. The tag team of Pat Tonka and Paul Diamond, known as Bad Company, continued to dominate the AWA tag team division with the help of the manager DDP, or Diamond Dallas Page, who would often interfere in the matches to ensure their victories. AWA Inter- international television champion Greg Gagne was left without a rival after Kurt Hennon's departure. Former NWA champion Ronnie Garvin defeated Gagne for the TV title. Um, Lawler's toughest challenger was former NBA World Heavyweight Champion Kerry Von Eric, who uh, leading the Texas versus Tennessee feud. The interpromotional Superclass 3 was set, featuring stars from the AWA, CWA, and WCWA. Um, disagreements arose uh, over which wrestlers would win their matches, but Lawler versus uh, Von Eric was the main event. The event was a disappointment in attendance and in pay-per-view guys. Um, AWA promoter Vern Gagne lied about the gate receipts and refused to pay anyone involved with CWA and WCWA. What a guy. What a fucking guy Vern Gagne was. Gagne then stripped from Jerry Lawler the AWA Heavyweight Championship, leading to the dissolution of the promotional alliance. Uh, yeah, saw that one coming. Uh, after Vern Gagne stripped Jerry Lawler of the AWA Championship in January 1989, many fans who watched AWA on ESPN were unaware of the fallout between Gagne and Lawler. Uh, instead of holding a tournament to try a new champion, champion Gunny decided the AWA Championship was going to be um, the winner of the Battle Royale held in St. Paul, Minnesota, on February 7, 1989. Larry Sabisco emerged uh, victorious in the Battle Royale to become the AWA Heavyweight Champion of the World. However, the AWA's talent roster was clearly depleted following the fallout between Lawler and Gagne, as evidenced by a list of wrestlers who entered the Battle Royale. Some fans and critics saw Larry Sabisco's uh, marriage to Vern Gagne's daughter as evidence of nepotism, with Vern's unable to put the championship on his son Greg. He instead made his son, his son-in-law the AWA champion. Larry Sabisco, also known as a living legend, made false claims about retiring Bruno San Montino and Nick Ballwinkle to enhance his, uh, to enhance his character's reputation. Despite being a skill wrestler, Larry was known for his stalling technique and would often, often re- refuse to lock up with his opponent for the first few minutes of the match to draw heat with the fans. Pat Tatonka and Paul Diamond um, held the AWA champ for a spending area uh, extended period in time until defeated by Kim Patera and Brad Ring, and uh, you know I don't know how to say his last name, who were known as the Olympians. In a surprising book, booking decision, uh, Tatanka and Diamond split apart and become enemies, with Tatanka joining forces with Aki, Akio Sato to form a new heel tag team, with Diamond becoming a fan favorite. The AWA also elevated Wayne Bloom and Mike Enos from the pre- preliminary wrestlers to main event superstars known as the Destruction Crew, who were managed by luscious Johnny Valiant. They became notorious for injuring silver opponents, including Walton McDaniel and Kim Patera. Due to Patera's injury, the AWA stripped um, re- re- reigns or rankings of the tag team titles and held the destruction of the crown of new champions, which was run by the Destruction Crew. Greg Gagne retired in 1989 after a career injury angle with the uh, Co- Coquina Maximus and Sheik Adon El Cassie, which involved him being attacked and splashed several times by the 500 pound Samoan Giant. The AWA introduces the Team Challenge series, which involved all the AWA wrestlers being divided into three teams, uh, captained by Larry Sabisco, Sergeant Slaughter, and Baron, Ra- Baron Von Rask, and competing in a series of gimmick matches for a $1 million prize. The Team Challenge series was widely criticized for the idiotic gimmick matches, and the AWA's declining fortunes were reflected in dwindling attendance and at its house shows. Larry Sabisco defended the AWA championship against various opponents, including Ger- Greg Gagne, Sergeant Slaughter, and Nikita Kloloff. DJ Peterson, Peterson in an attempt to gain notoriety. He agreed to defend the belt against Mr. Sato at, at the Tokyo Dome in Japan, but lost to Amory gained it a few months later in St. Paul, Minnesota. Meanwhile, the Destruction crew um, continued to dominate the tag team division until they were defeated by DJ Peterson and the Trooper, who became the AWA Tag Team Champions. The Tag Team cha- Challenge Series um, ended with the infamous Great American Turkey Fine Match, which was won by Jake the Milkman Millman. Uh, who was on Larry Sabisco's team called Larry Legends. The AWA lost his contract with the ESPN in late 1990 and became virtually inactive, leading to Larry Sabisco joining WCW and the promotion closing soon after. After all that shit show I just read you, um, if your ears aren't bleeding already, let's get a conclusion of what the AWA was. The AWA was founded in 1960 by Vern Gagne, a former wrestler and amateur wrestler who was based in Minneapolis, Minnesota. It was one of the largest wrestling promotions in the United States. In the 1960s, AWA dominated uh, by Vern Gagne, who held the AWA World Heavyweight Championship several times. He also trained and mentored a number of other wrestlers who became uh, stars in the AWA and other promotions, including The Crusher and Larry Henning. The 1970s saw the rise of the new generation of stars in the AWA, including Nick Bob and Cole Bobby Heenan and Hulk Hogan. Hogan began his wrestling career in, uh, in the AWA. Um, the AWA was once a thriving wrestling promotion in the U.S., but declined in the 1980s due to various factors. Vern Gagne, who were reluctant to change with times and focus on old-school wrestling styles, was one of the primary reasons for the AWA's decline. The AWA introduced a gimmicky programming like the Team Talent Challenge Series, which was poorly received by fans. Larry Sabisco was a prominent figure in the AWA during his last days and was the AWA's a heavyweight champion multiple times and the last AWA champion. The Destruction Crew, consisting of Mike Enos and Wayne Bloom, became a dominant tag team in late 
And then when Lisa Bisco joined WCW in December of 90, he was stripped of the title, leading to the promotion's demise. And all, the AWA was a, was a great promotion to cover and really go back and watch. If you have a chance, go watch some of the greater matches of the Nick Bollinkle series. Um, the Rise of Hulk Hogan was really cool, even though Vern would never put him over. Um, this is episode two of our Diving Into the Territories. This was really fun for me. I hope it was uh, just as fun listening to you. Hopefully you learned something today. Uh, other than that, guys, um, I hope you all have a great day today. And um, uh, we'll jump into it next week with another dive, dive into the territory. I have no idea what it's going to be yet. I want to kind of want to do Smoky Mountain Wrestling. Obviously, this was not mentioned in the last episode. The AWA was not mentioned at all. But obviously, uh, we did it here. This is a 40-minute video. Hopefully, you got us to the end here. If you did, well, then I don't know why you wouldn't just like and subscribe. Um, well, I'll see you on the next one. Love y'all. I'm Kurt Hennig and Big Scott Hall. As tag team champs, we'll take on them all. So bring on the long riders, those dirt ball dumbos. We'll smear those bushes. Do the wrestle rock rumble. Uh.